Hey everybody, this is Kyle Werner from Confluent. Today I want to talk about the rise of event streaming in the retail industry. I will explore several different real-world use cases in architecture so that you learn how to leverage Apache Kafka and its ecosystem for processing data in motion. Let's get started with the motivation for doing this. And I think it's obvious that the world is changing everywhere. This is true for retail like for many other industries. And actually, it's not so much just about the stores themselves, like a lot of this becomes software. So you online, uh, you order online, right? But often it's a hybrid model where you order online and then you pick it up in a store. So the stores don't go away. But in addition to that, it's also about the payment integration. So how you pay for what you buy. It's typically different apps you have available, different payment services, often also integrate into the loyalty platform of the company. And with that then, even the delivery is many options. So you don't have to pick it up in a store. You can get it delivered to your house, in some use cases, even within an hour in a big city. So this is completely changing how you have to think about retail. And this is just a few examples to show you um, the motivation for this talk today and where I can show you the real world examples later. But the main point is techn technology is drifting away from being just a support function. Instead, it's really the business. So this means new innovation is typically coming from technology and not just from hardware or from on-site offerings in the, in the store. And this is really what many people say, software is eating the world. And we've just seen a few examples how this is really true in retail and completely game-changing how you buy new things in the future. And for most of these use cases, Actually, you need a modern real-time data infrastructure to provide these innovative services. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And the point is really that this is happening everywhere. And here's just a few examples where you today can leverage a lot of real-time use cases because otherwise you cannot provide a good customer experience. And as you can see here, this is true for traditional players that exist for many decades like Walmart and Target. On the other side, this is also true um, for companies like Amazon, where it's obvious because uh, they um, do a good, good customer experience for a long time. That's one of the reasons why they are successful. But then there is also other companies like Shopify. Th they don't have their own stores, right? They provide an infrastructure for others. And so this just shows there are so many different business models from both the traditional players and the more um, innovative startups that started Greenfield a few years ago. Everybody in retail has to change to stay competitive in the market. And we will see a lot of these examples again in the session today. So in summary, if you want to talk about the disruptive trends in retail, it's always three different kind of points that you want to solve. So first of all, obviously you want to provide new business models. So this is where you build completely new innovation in use cases like maybe augmented reality, where you can shop at home and use your mobile phone to show how it looks um, like furniture in your living room. So this is just one of the examples. But um, new business models is really a key part of retail so that you rethink how you buy things. And with that, the other key part, no matter if it's for new business models or for the traditional stuff, you need to provide a better customer experience so that the customer is happy shopping with you and um, coming back again and again. And you can also upsell more easily if the shopping experience is great. But for this, often you also need operational efficiencies. Um, the best example and what you will also see today a few times is the real-time inventory. Many of the new retail models are only possible if you have information in real time. And so um, op optimizing the supply chain in the background, that's super important for providing a good customer experience and new business models. And this is the trend we see across verticals in retail and business units. So these are the three key pillars you have to take a look at. And now, how can we get there? First of all, what's super important to understand, and if you rethink that, I think you will agree, is that real-time data beats slow data. That's true in almost all use cases. There is a few examples where a batch process overnight is okay, or maybe even better. This can be a report from the BI team where you want to create a daily or re weekly report for your management about how the sales is um, happening in a specific store, for example, or even globally. So this is a batch process and it's totally okay. Another example, if you want to train analytic models with AI and machine learning. Here you take historical data from the last day or week or year and train a model on that to find insights. That's typically a process that runs over hours or even days. And for that, it's totally okay to have a batch process. But for all these examples you see here and many more, 
Real-time data beats slow data, and this can increase revenue or make a better customer experience or increase their operational efficiency. If you think about one example, like fraud detection in the payment process, of course you can run the, pay pay the fraud detection overnight in a batch process, but well, then it's too late. You still detect the fraud, but uh, it already happened, so you already lost the money, right? And in real-time inventory, if you want to process this in batch overnight to make an update, well, um, if a customer wants to um, buy it online and then pick it up in the store, this only works if you really know that this item is available in this specific store. And you can go across use cases. This is true everywhere. Real-time data beats slow data. And in addition to that, what we also see in the market is that verticals are changing. Like here's a few of the of the latest um, um, articles I have read. So like Walmart is getting into the payment business, and a few other companies like Walgreens offer bank accounts, and then these these delivery companies like DoorDash and Instacart start a credit card, and then also of course with loyalty programs and all these things. So it's simply that it's not just about selling things, but about integrating payments, integrating other platforms, but also working with partners, of course. So it's simply merging and not the same like you thought about retail a few years ago. So, I mean, we all agree that one fundamental paradigm shift for this is the cloud. This means it's the future of the data center and you're elastic and flexible how you provide infrastructure. You can scale it up over Christmas in retail, but afterwards you can also scale it down. And this is the cloud native way. Even if you're not running the public cloud, but in your own data center, most of the companies today use something like containers and Kubernetes to be elastic and scalable and flexible. So this is a fundamental paradigm shift for infrastructure. And what I want to talk about today is the same paradigm shift, but for data. So we will learn how retail is completely changing because you leverage event streaming to process data in motion continuously while it is interesting. And that's the future of data instead of just storing data in a store, so a data store, database, or in a data lake, because there it's at rest and someone else picks it up later, but that's too late for many use cases, because again, in most cases, real time beats slow data. And this is the motivation for this talk today. And here's a first example. So this is advanced auto parts. And what they are doing in the end, um, they are selling car parts, right? So they are a traditional store. They also have an online offering. And on the left side, you see it um, on the top, their traditional architecture they had, where they had a lot of different um, um, components like messaging systems with MQ. They had IBM mainframes, AS400, so a lot of really old systems. And then a pricing engine and um, then some other stuff for the data catalog. So, so a lot of different platforms across data centers. And they completely re-engineered this to focus on business outcomes. And this is exactly its approach. So they want to provide data in real time, even if it's integrated data from different systems. And they want to do this in a, a truly serverless and elastic way to scale up, but also scale down. And for that, as you can see at the bottom left, they are now leveraging um, Confluent Cloud as a completely managed platform for processing data in motion. They still have some of the legacy systems they need to integrate. But in parallel, some of the legacy systems, as you can see here, like, like MQ or AS400, um, can be replaced with modern technology. And, and this is the, the, the clear trend we see across um, different companies that they are going into this direction. And so this is a first great example for showing why uh, a retail company is moving the shift to a cloud native infrastructure and processing data in motion. But with that, let's talk a little bit more about what I actually mean with event streaming and processing data in motion. Well, an event is what happens in your business. And this can be a technical event, like something coming from your sensors. And this can be a business event, like when your customer uses the mobile app and does some um, clicks and does things, right? So the point is every event can be important and especially if it's correlated with other events. So this is the key point here. So you have different back-end systems and front-end systems like the mobile app and you can optimize the supply chain end-to-end, -end, especially if most of these systems speak real-time. This means as soon as something happens somewhere, you can correlate it with other information. Like in this case, in the front-end, you want to buy a product, but you want to pick it up now. Then you can see in real-time which store in your region has it available so that you can buy it there and then you can pick it up and you can be sure it's available. 
Or you can integrate that with a third-party shipping service that delivers it to you within two hours or whatever the guarantees of the service are. And so this is really the combination of many different systems and most of them can speak real-time data. Then you leverage all of that and correlate that. And this is the main idea behind event streaming. You process data in motion and with that your business becomes a stream of events. And here's a few examples for processing data in motion. And really it's across different business goals. So like increasing the revenue for providing a better inventory management, a better um, customer experience with um, examples like a better call center integration or a good know your customer experience. And there are so many examples, right? On the other side, it's also about decreasing costs to increase the operational efficiency, like um, modernizing the legacy IT infrastructure, like we have seen in the advanced auto parts example before. But then on the other side, also it's about mitigating the risks, like improving better prevention of fraud, doing cybersecurity, which is needed in, across industries today in real time, to have situational awareness of all the information that's flowing. So there is plenty of different examples across the different business goals. And the data infrastructure layer for that is a combination of different things. You need to uh, send data in real time, but you need to also process the data. You need to integrate with other systems. You need to aggregate data in a stateful way. And with that, you, however, also need to decouple different systems. And this combination of characteristics is what we can do with event streaming with one single platform across different use cases. So let's now take a look at a few real world examples. I think that's really the most important part of the session so that you understand what others are doing. The first example is Walmart, biggest employer in the US. So what they are doing is that they have deployed Kafka via Confluent as the backbone of the digital omnichannel transformation to be successful at Walmart across the different business units and supply chain flows. If we take a deeper look at that, and like in all the other examples I show, it's always screenshots from the end user presenting this. In this case, like they presented at Kafka Summit. And so one of the examples they have done is building a real-time inventory system, relying on event streaming at the heart of it. So this means that, as you can see at the bottom left in this picture, the central nervous system is a real-time scalable layer. This means you integrate with the warehousing and fulfillment, you in integrate with the inventory data, you also integrate with other um, batch systems like a data warehouse, but the heart of it is real-time and scalable. And with this you can provide a real omni-channel experience to the end user, to the customer. That's in the end the goal you have, right? To improve the process so that the customer is happy and uh, you increase your revenue with that. But you can, of course, also reduce the cost in the supply chain process. So, And as you can see on the top right side, even just the inventory management, this specific use case is huge. So um, you integrate with all your stores and with the distribution centers, but also with the apps of your customer mobile app. But then also with the vendors you work with, with the third party that deliver the things into your store, that do the shipping for you and all these other things for transportation, logistics and so on. And this is a great example where um, event streaming is used at scale by integrating many different systems to correlating information in real time at scale. In a similar way, um, Target, another very traditional player in the US, um, provides a similar experience um, for simplifying omnichannel retail. This means, once again, on the left side, you see they integrate with distribution centers with the stores, but then also with the digital channels, which are like the mobile app of the customer, so that you can also provide location-based services and so on. And Target, similar to Walmart, is using um, Kafka at scale for processing data in motion. So um, they integrate with many systems, and as a key piece of that, they also use this for transactional data. As you can see in, in one of the points here on the bottom left, um, they leverage exactly one semantics, which means that um, event streaming can be used at scale for analytical data, but it can also be used for transactional workloads like integration with the point of sale system. That's what many of our customers are doing these days. And then they leverage technologies like Kafka Streams for doing um, stateful and stateless processing of the data continuously with Kafka native technology. And so this is another great example from a traditional retail player. 
Another great example is Adidas. So they talked uh, at one of the last Kafka summits about um, their challenge during the pandemic and how um, they now changed where, when, oh, as they said, uh, when all your stores are closed, e-commerce becomes your bigger store and the most challenging one. And they built their own solution called Holmes, which is um, a solution where you um, can have visibility and observability in real time to detect problems in real time and then also find the root causes to solve the problems. And so in this use case, it's a more, let's say, technical use case, right? So this is about um, metrics and logs, but analyzing all of that in real time at scale. As you can see in the architecture, the bottom left, so um, they are leveraging a, a scalable Kubernetes cluster, or actually several of them, and they run a, a highly reliable Kafka cluster to process all the logs and incoming system from many different sources, and then put it also into different applications again. Like on the right side in the architecture, you see they're in, running in the cloud and as one of the reporting tools, they're using the Elastic stack for some dashboards. Um, you also see a Golang logo where they write some own applications with Go code. And you're very flexible how to build new applications completely decoupled from each other. But the heart of the infrastructure is the scalable real-time systems to connect all the other systems, no matter if they're real-time or batch. But the heart of it is real-time here to provide observability at scale at Adidas. Now, uh, also, very interesting example is AO.com, an electrical retailer in the UK. And they are also a traditional player, actually. They um, had stores 20 years ago, um, but they moved much more into the online business. And what they actually built is a scenario where you can provide a hyper-personalized online retail experience. So what does that mean? This means it, it's a little bit more than just the, the very old 20-year um, old Amazon use case where you... Um, get recommended as things like, hey, um, you bought already this, other customers were also interested in this and that. So this is this is still valuable, but um, with a hyper-personalized online retail experience, you're going much far beyond that. This means you really correlate both the historical customer data, like the information in the CRM and loyalty system, together with real-time digital signals. And this can be, for example, when the customer is um, hovering on the website with the mouse and is taking a look at an article. You re analyze in real-time how long he's looking at a specific article and at what features he's looking at. And then when he's moving to another article and so on. And with that in real-time, you can provide context-specific information or recommendations or even coupons if you want to sell it and give a discount to this customer because he's a loyal customer or because you have too much in your real-time inventory system and you need to sell some of them. So this is a correlation of all the different front-end and back-end systems to provide a great customer experience, but with that also increase the revenue, of course. And another interesting part of this story is the journey of AO, as you can see at the top right. So um, like many other of our customers, actually, they started with a few small use cases. And in the beginning, already they found out, well, we don't need to send data just from A to B. We need to integrate with many systems. That's in this case, they are also using the .NET client. Like not everything is in the Java world, right? So they're using specific clients for other programming languages. But in addition, they also leverage Kafka Connect for doing direct data integration, like with an ETL tool, but they leverage the Kafka ecosystem for that. And actually, they also use the schema registry to provide data governance and schema enforcement. And with KSQL, they continuously process the data with Kafka. And then the next interesting part was after they have run the first use cases in production, they thought, well, actually, we want to focus on the business problems and not operate the infrastructure. So they migrated to Confluent Cloud, which is their only truly serverless Kafka offering on the market, so that they really can focus on their business. And Confluent provides the SLAs and the scale and elasticity, so that you really use Confluent for Kafka as a service with consumption-based pricing. And then you can scale it up when needed or scale it down. And so in 2020, then they started thinking about the platform so that not every business unit starts their own Kafka cluster, but they have a clear strategy from a company perspective about this platform thinking. And this is really a great journey because this is what we see with many of our customers in this space. They start small, they roll out more use cases, they go into more cloud-based service offerings, and then they get into platform thinking. So another great example is Nuli. This is part of Urban Outfitters, but it's in the end its own company. And the goal here was to build a new innovative business model. So this is really this try and error that you try out new things. If they don't, if they fail, throw it away. 
if they're successful, like in this case, then you scale it up easily. So Newly um, is doing a clothing rental subscription service. This is something what I thought actually cannot work, right? But it seems to work. And so this is very different from a typical e-commerce model. Um, and it needs to provide real-time data correlation to provide, for example, a next recommendation um, for what to send to this customer, what to rent. And in this case, the interesting part is that, as I said, this is more or less a greenfield project. They started with Confluent Cloud to really focus on the business problem. And with that, they um, could launch the service in production in less than six months. And they're stable with that, right? Um, so um, you can set up a production environment in a week because it's truly serverless. And then you can build your first version and your pilot project and then go in production with your use cases. And with that, you don't just reduce the cost for the infrastructure for, for event streaming, but you can really um, focus on the business problems. And therefore, this is a great example at Nuli. They started small with the service, and then you can easily scale it up and roll it out when you're successful without changing the architecture, without spending or worrying about that. You just focus still on the business features and pay with consumption-based pricing. Another example from the retail industry is Stitch Fix. This is also another one of these more, let's say, innovative um, um, use cases and companies where they provide an online personal styling service. The interesting part about this use case now, and I try to, to talk about different kind of use cases and challenges these, these end users um, are implementing. Um, in this case, I want to show that um, here they are talking a lot about how they leverage machine learning and AI together with the event streaming platform around Kafka. So in this case, you see a few of the architectures. And again, like for all the other examples, um, this is all public information from Kafka Summit Talks or other events. So you can take a look at that to learn much more detail. My point here just was that um, they use event streaming together with machine learning infrastructure to do better recommendations. And um, data is everywhere in machine learning, right? For doing the pre-processing, for um, creating the features for model training, but then also for model scoring to do the predictions about what recommendations should I give to a customer. And then you can also roll out things like A-B testing better with AI. And all these things are combined here. And this is the great part about the story. And I don't even want to go into more technical details. Um, you can really take out take a look at this talk where you see that even someone like a data scientist team um, that is focusing on Python and Jupyter notebooks, it's super easy to combine that with an event streaming platform. So it's not just for the production deployment, it's really also for the interactive and rapid prototyping and model training and all these kind of stuff. And also, of course, integration with other machine learning platforms, no matter if you're in the cloud or if you're using an open source framework for machine learning. So the last example here is Migros. This is what maybe many of you don't know. So this is Switzerland's largest retail company and largest supermarket chain, and therefore also the largest employer in Switzerland, similar to Walmart in the US. And the interesting part about this use case is that they have built a real-time transportation information visualization. And for that, as you can see um, in, in the screenshots on the right in the end, this is end-to-end -end about the supply chain. So this is not just in data centers or in warehouses. This is really about the street where you have the trucks. And therefore, in this case, um, because the event streaming platform is typically running in a data center in most cases, um, here they combine it with an IoT technology, in this case, the MQTT standard, because this is very lightweight and this is built for bad networks and for also connecting to hundreds of thousands of interfaces like trucks on the street. And this is a very common combination in these kind of IoT scenarios. I have also a blog series about that if you wonder more about use cases and architectures. But the point here is that you can do supply chain optimization with a single streaming pipeline. And this is, yes, on the one side, real-time data, right? Where you track things in real time for track and trace and um, recommendations and routing in real time. For example, for forecasting the track arrival plan. But on the other side, you can also replay the data of whole days of events. And with that, you can also, in parallel to running the real-time infrastructure, do analytics on historical data to improve the processes, like improving the forecasting model for the next day or the next week. So with that, I talked a lot about use cases. Let me quickly also cover more about the technology. Um, I hope today in 2021, you already know a little bit about Kafka. Um, if not, um, Kafka is really a unique combination of different characteristics. It's a combination of messaging at scale for real-time, sending data from A to B, 
But the key is that it's also a combination with storage, which also stores the data as events as long as you want to store them. This can be a day, this can be a week, this can be forever. And so it's truly decoupling the different systems with that. And then it also provides the integration and processing capabilities so that you integrate with sources and things and you correlate the data from different systems in real time. That together is Kafka and this is how it looks like. So Kafka is a platform for data in motion. Some also call it event streaming platform. And this is really, you connect to all the different systems. Not all of them are real time, some are batch. Some are request response, some are a file-based integration for legacy systems. Then you get these events in and you correlate them in real time where it makes sense. And then you're also ingested into other systems that can be a real time notification system, location-based services on a mobile app, or this can be some other more like near real time or batch systems like a data warehouse or a machine learning infrastructure. That's totally up to you and you can onboard these use cases step by step. And then these are the, the unique characteristics of Kafka compared to other systems. So with Kafka, you can really make your business real time. So this is really a game changer for many of these use cases we have seen. If you rethink about the use case I showed you before, most of them don't work if your systems are not real time for connecting the different sources and things, correlating the data and so on. And then there's different technologies to implement that. You can write everything in Java or in C++. You can also use Python. You can use JavaScript from the mobile app. You can use a REST proxy to com communicate via HTTP to your interfaces. Or like in this example, we are using KSQL so that you write SQL code to do Kafka native stream processing. One more example for that. So um, this is the risk management with stream processing at Tesco. So um, this is a British multinational groceries and merchandise retailer, one of the largest in Europe. And this is an interesting use case about the risk management platform. So as you can see, this is really critical because if your risk management doesn't work well, then you might be in trouble. So they re-engineered from a traditional risk engine they had with a messaging platform and with a relational database in the middle, as you can see on the left side in the architecture. There were a few problems with that. It didn't scale well. Um, it, was a no, it was a single point of failure. Um, it was really not easy to change and improve things and the performance was not perfect. And that's why they moved over to a Kafka-based infrastructure on the right side. And here you see now, this is much more scalable because Kafka natively scales. You don't have to worry about that. And in this case, they are leveraging Kafka streams for stream processing, for correlating different information in real time. And you can scale such a risk engine up and down. Maybe you need more of this during the Christmas, Christmas or other specific days. And at the bottom, you also see, um, they are also integrating with many external systems like traditional databases. So not everything is shut down when you move to Kafka, but then you can also onboard more and more new systems like in the cloud. And so th this is a great example again of how to leverage the complete platform for stream processing. And in the green, you see a few of the examples they had, like separation of concerns, a distributed reliable platform, data locality, and, and all these things. And in most cases, this is true for most of the end users of Kafka that are happy. They talk in a similar way about why they're using this in contrary to other existing systems. They already have in place often like ETL tools and MQ systems. So with that, as we discussed, um, this is how you can build a central nervous system. Your business as streams of events. And this is what's the, the real game changer here. No matter if some of the systems are not real time yet, that's okay. Like in case of the reporting, this might be not real time forever because that's okay for that. But like the inventory and the shipping and ordering systems and so on, they should be real time because that makes the customer happy and improves your cost and supply chain perspective. And I said this before, but the beauty about Kafka is also you can scale. So you don't need to architect again if you need to scale. You start small with a business case. In most cases, we don't see customers starting with a terabyte of data, right? Um, or a throughput of megabytes per second. This can happen for log data, but especially for transactional data, you start very small with maybe a few hundred transactions per second. But then you can scale it up like you need. You don't have to worry about that. We have customers in Confluent Cloud that process over 10 gigabyte per second and more with a single Kafka cluster. So this is really huge and enough for most of the workloads you will have, I guess. So let's also tackle another question here again, because this comes up all the time. Why can't you do this with your existing platforms, like your messaging platforms, your ETL tool, your data warehouse? I mean, you always can find some workarounds for some of the problems, right? But um, 
the, again, the unique difference of the event streaming platform is that it's a combination of uh, providing a real-time infrastructure for messaging at scale. So you can use it for small data sets, transactional data, but also for high volume analytics data. And then it's also persistent and durable. And this is super important to decouple the different systems from each other. This is very different from a messaging queue where you consume it once and then it's deleted. In a Kafka log, it's stored forever as long as you want so that other consumers can also consume it later. And this is super important, really. And in addition to that, then again, it's also about integration with other systems and data processing. That's also part of one single platform instead of combining many different ones. And so um, here's a, a comparison of event streaming to these other platforms. And to be very clear here, um, so I'm not saying you should use event streaming for every problem, right? So um, if you just want to store some data persistently um, and then do some very complex queries on that, well, that's a database. And in many cases, it's even just a relational database like Oracle or MySQL. If you need it at a higher scale or for unstructured data, then you go to something like MongoDB or, or similar things in the cloud. You're very flexible, but this is then the right use cases. If you just want to send data from A to B in real time, at, at least at small scale, then an existing messaging platform is good for that. And with this, you see all of these have their use cases, but the unique characteristic of event streaming is that it combines the different characteristics for building new use cases. And so these other systems are still good for their use cases. Um, the point of event streaming is to think about an event-driven transformation. And then you still combine it with these other systems, like um, most of our customers today use the event streaming platform as the scalable nervous system in real time. But then all of them ingest into a data warehouse. And this can be a traditional one or this can be a modern cloud native one like Snowflake or something like BigQuery for analytics on Google. You're very flexible and it's typically a combination. So I'm not saying all these others are bad, but they are often combined with event streaming for having the, the, the heart of it in real time at scale. And so one more point about um, the decoupling. That's super important. And um, with Kafka, you truly decouple different systems. And this is working well because on the one side, you can send data from A to B in real time. But on the other side, because Kafka also stores the data, they're truly decoupled from each other. So in this case, um, you might have um, some, some point of sale systems that continuously send data to Kafka because it's some kind of um, legacy program that simply sends an update every second and that from thousands of point of sale systems. And over time, you might architect this in another way to deploy new point of sale systems. But for today, it's legacy code. And so this is producing all the time. But on the other side, the mobile backend on the right side, well, you don't want to push a lot of this information to the mobile backend of some, some um, end user in your company. And so um, you only store it in Kafka and then you pre-process it with the streaming capabilities and only send the relevant aggregated data into another domain. And then on the left side in the data warehouse, this is still a batch process. So maybe every minute you take all the events from that minute and then you ingest it into data warehouse. And so this is again truly decoupled from each other. And this is very different from a messaging system where you put it in the queue once and then it's when it's consumed, it's done, it's deleted. In Kafka, it's not. And so you truly decouple because not everything is processing data at the same time in real time. And also you can replay the data. If now you have all of this running and then you give the data to a data scientist, in, this, in his domain he uses a Python client and then consumes historical data from the same Kafka cluster, completely decoupled from the others. And, and this is one of the unique characteristics of Kafka. And here is another example for that from the architecture. So this is SOK IT. This is a, a retailer in the Nordics. And they have implemented actually exactly what I showed on the last slide. So um, you see in the picture the event stream. All the events are coming in, most of them in real time, some from legacy systems. But then on the one side, you have uh, real-time processes like um, in red. But then you also have an ETL process for ingesting data warehouse. And the indexing into the search engine, so that's something like Elasticsearch. So that's also happening only in near real time because um, most of these indexers are built for near real time processing, not for real time. And so with this, you have true decoupling of the different applications. But the heart of it, the event stream is real time. And, and this makes it this architecture so powerful and flexible. So as the last section of this talk, let me talk a little bit more about the architectures for retail. 
And if we take a look, for example, at the supply chain optimization, even just here, there's so many use cases. Like here's a few of the examples, like where you can do better um, sales demand forecasting. You can eliminate the bottlenecks in the supply chain. You can do better capacity planning and, and risk analysis in real time. But on the other side, you can also take an historical look at the data for compliance and for regulatory use cases. So there's plenty of use cases just if you take a look at the supply chain. And if we take now a look at such an architecture, it's not really an architecture, it's actually just the Kafka log itself. The Kafka log means you produce data to the log in real time or in batch of wherever the data comes from. But then each consumer that is again truly decoupled can consume the data like they need. In this case, in red, consumer one, this is a real-time alerting system. They consume the data in real time in milliseconds as it happens from other systems. In green, you have a stateful use case where you take different events. For example, you do a continuous aggregation of the events of the last 10 minutes to correlate the data. Or like in this example for geofencing, for distance enforcement, this is still an aggregation that has to happen in real time. Like you aggregate all of the sensor events from the last five seconds. And if something is not working well, you send an alert to the machine or to the human or whatever. And in addition to this, then on the left side in blue, we have a batch process. So this is for the planning of the future routing and logistics of the next day. So here you consume all the events of the last day overnight, run a botch process of an hour, and then the outcome is the routing and logistics for the next day, completely decoupled from the other applications. And with that, then you can roll this out like you need. So Kafka is very scalable. And um, with that, you can also have different deployments. This is possible to do it everywhere, multi-cloud, on-premise, at the edge. So this is really where you're very flexible. And um, this is what our customers are doing, depending on the company and where you are working and, and so on. Um, but really, you can roll it out as you need hybridly across different data centers, edge, clouds, and so on. So one more example here, this is Porsche. So Porsche is not really retail, but in the end they also sell cars, right? So it's um, customers communicating with the retail store, in this case, um, the, the car selling perspective. And uh, therefore I use this use case because it's, it's simply showing a little bit of another point of view, but the problems are very much the same. And Porsche has built a digital service platform for their, what they say, customers, fans, and enthusiasts. So it's not just about buying something, it's about an experience. And this is true for things like in fashion and retail. This is true for many other kind of business units. And they are heavily relying on Kafka. Like they also talk about that at their Porsche developer blog. Um, and they also had a recent Kafka summit talk about that. And the story is again the same. So, so I repeat myself, but it's a truly decoupling system in the middle. It's real time, it's scalable. You can integrate with everything. So it's always the same story. And with that, if you think about that from a generic perspective now, how can you build an omnichannel retail solution? Well, once again, you see the picture of the log here. New events are produced in real time. And in this case, now we have some historical data. On the left side, in red, we have the context-specific marketing campaigns. This is newsletters to people registered to an, a car maker. And this happened every 30 days, like 90 days ago and 60 days ago. And then from a completely different interface, you realize that the same customer ID is using the car configurator 10 days ago. And then eight days ago, they're using it again and they're changing some of the features. Maybe 10 days ago, it was the man and husband. And then um, two days later, he talked to his wife and said, hey, do we want to buy this car? And then she said, no, not in this color. Let's change it. So there's another event happening later. And then a few days later, today, um, both of these people walk into the car dealership. And this might even be a location-based service so that directly when you're walking in the store with the, with the mobile app installed on your uh, mobile phone, um, the salesperson in the dealership already gets a notification to say, hey, this is the customer XYZ coming to the store. He already owns these cars. And we also have this other background information. Like um, we probably need to give him a 15% discount because then he will not buy the car otherwise. And, and these kind of correlations from backend systems, historical data and real-time systems. And, and this combined then provides very powerful omnichannel use cases. And in addition to these use cases then, the same data can be accessed from other business units. 
Of course, depending on your privacy rules and like in Europe, like GDPR, for example, um, sometimes you only can give anonymized data away or aggregated data or filtered data. That's okay, but because that's what you also can do with Kafka before then you hand over the data to um, other tools. Like in this case, you see for the reporting with the BI team that uses Tableau or with the data science team that uses TensorFlow to train even better recommendation engines based on the historical data. So this is how such an architecture is super flexible, how to build new applications with different technologies, but using the same stream of data. And if we go deeper into the architecture, and this is the last topic I want to cover in this talk, um, here we see a hybrid retail architecture. At the top, you see that um, here um, we have all the central applications. In this case, in AWS Cloud, everything is running fully managed including the Kafka cluster with Confluent Cloud, including separate external systems like Salesforce for the CRM and other third-party integrations. What's interesting here is that we are also running a Kafka cluster at the edge in a retail store in this case that integrates with the cloud. So it's a bidirectional replication with the Kafka protocol so that you even have this replication and integration in real time. So that's also part of the Kafka ecosystem. And if we take a look into the store, why do you do it here? Well, in many cases, we have seen customers that have a very bad internet connectivity. Like during the day, while many people are in the store and the 4G or 5G or the, the Wi-Fi is bad. And so um, they need to do edge computing with low latency in the store, integration with the point of sale system. But then also more advanced um, use cases like for the inventory management that you integrate with the cloud service so that you know where a customer ordering in the cloud can pick it up. And then also even more advanced use cases like real-time edge analytics for doing location-based services. While the customer is leaving the store and going somewhere else, you can send him a notification. Hey, if you buy this item now, then you get 40% discount because my inventory is so high. That's what you don't tell the customer, but it's your internal information why you're sending the 40% discount. And these are things that have to run um, in low latency, therefore close to the store in most cases. And the other important part is, again, the connectivity. A lot of this cannot rely on internet in many um, sites. So you can do this with a Kafka cluster on site, always offline. You can do all of that very easily there. And again, why do people use Kafka here? Because instead of deploying many systems at the edge, you can do many things with one platform. It's not just real-time messaging. It's also the storage. If you're offline, then you can store it here in the log. And then overnight, when you have a good online connection, then you replicate it to the cloud. But in parallel, you can also integrate to all these edge systems in real time, like the point of sale systems and correlate and filter the data in the, in the edge so that you only send the relevant data to the cloud. This is why we see so many more edge deployments. To have one last example here, this is Royal Caribbean Cruises. They are actually running one mission critical Kafka cluster on every single ship. And they are doing edge analytics exactly as I described it on the last slides. So um, they have integrated to the point of sale systems, to the restaurants and so on. They have location-based services based on a mobile app you need to install when you're on such a cruise tour. And so they're doing all of that offline because here it's even more crazy about internet connectivity and cost. And therefore they do all of that on the ship. And then when they're going back into the harbor about after a three-day uh, cruise, then they have a good internet connection for three or four hours. And here they replicate all the data back to the cloud. And in the cloud, you consume the data from all the different ships. And with that, you can do big data analytics in the cloud where you find new insights. And then when you have the insights, you deploy them back to the ship on the next rollout. So this is really a, a really cool example for a disconnected edge use case for Kafka connected still to the hybrid cloud so that you have still a big Kafka cluster also in the cloud running. So this is a perfect example for edge and hybrid stream processing. Yeah, and with that, I hope you agree that um, event streaming with processing data in motion is the same paradigm shift um, for data, like we know about building cloud native applications for having a more elastic infrastructure. Let me quickly talk about why people come to us for that, actually. I mean, most of the use cases you have seen, um, they are not coming from today to tomorrow. It's not a big bang, it's a journey. And we can help you from the beginning of this journey so that you set it up right from the beginning, that you focus on the right use cases, do the right configurations. Or if you're in the cloud, well, then you can focus on the business from day one because you consume it as a truly serverless offering. And with that, then you can roll out more and more, go into production, 
go more global, go hybrid, multi-region, whatever your use case is. And then you get the more central nervous system around Kafka. And yeah, well, the rise of data in motion, actually, it started over 10 years ago where Apache Kafka was open sourced by LinkedIn. And then actually in 2014, Confluent was founded by the inventors of Kafka. And with that, to make Kafka enterprise ready. And I mean, that, that's what happened, right? And with that, almost every bigger company today is adopting Kafka or has adopted it. Um, many of them are working with Confluent on that. So this is really not the question today anymore. And the question is, how many use cases do you already have for Kafka? What have you already deployed? And where are you going in this curve to stay competitive on the market? And so our goal is to complete Kafka everywhere. This means, first of all, um, we also work on the car engine itself, right? So Kafka itself is the open source framework. We are doing over 80% of the commits to this framework. And this is the heart of our platform. But it's just a car engine. It runs reliable and scalable, but you need to build and deploy it by yourself. What we also provide is Confluent Platform, which is our complete car. That's already safe, secure, it takes over monitoring, operations, bug fixes, and all these kind of things. And so you can buy a complete car and, and focus on the business problem. This is the self-managed Kafka in the ecosystem, like connectors, data governance, security, and so on. If you're in the cloud, you're even more lucky because then you can even buy a truly self-driving car, level five. Because here it's a truly serverless offering, the only serverless offering on the market. Many others say they are fully managed, but actually they just provision brokers for you. And then you have to do the bug fixing and the rolling upgrades and the performance tuning and the scale and so on. Here it's a truly serverless offering. And so if you're in the cloud and just want to focus on the business problems, this is probably the way to go for you on all major cloud providers. And this is our strategy to complete Kafka, run it everywhere and um, provide it in a cloud native elastic way, either in the cloud or even on premise or at the edge. And therefore, we have plenty of features and all these things, commercial support. This is what I don't want to, to pitch today. Just take a look at our website if you want to learn more about that. And um, this is growing day to day and there's so many exciting features we have in the meantime so that you can really focus on the business problems. Last slide, transforming our customers' apps and data architecture. This is just a few numbers. This is important from a management perspective um, because you always take a look at increasing the revenue or reducing the cost or mitigating the risk. And this is actually what we are doing for our customers. Especially in the cloud, it's also easy to measure this. And therefore, we have a few of these numbers regarding productivity and reduced cost and operations and so on. Um, we can also help you with that. Um, just come to us and we can do some more business value consulting with you to find out how much money you can save or how much more effective you can be by leveraging Confluent. Yeah, and with that, um, I'm done. So um, it was great to talk about this. So just let me know if you have any feedback. Um, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or on LinkedIn to stay in touch. And with that, looking forward to your feedback and hoping to talk to you um, in person too. Thanks for watching.